So here's the thing, homeowners, homebuyers, investors, we all want to find that perfect property to move into and to eventually sell for profit. And we want to make that purchase in a place with affordable, safe, quality homes, communities, and businesses. Why? So we can actually enjoy our lives, take vacations, and spend the quality time we want with the people we love. How do we do all this without risking a fortune and running ourselves ragged? That's the big question, and this show is dedicated to the answer. So uh, it would go back to, again, the basic idea here. Where is Vancouver going to find the thousands of new units that we've always been able to supply in one form or another through either basically greenfield sites, expand the suburbs along the streetcar lines, Mm -hmm. then the automobile. So we're out to Oak Ridge and southeast Vancouver. We've either done those streetcar suburbs themselves through the high rises of the West End, through urban renewal, through the mega projects. When I was on council, we had about seven mega projects going simultaneously, seven. So we're talking North Shore Falls Creek, Coal Harbor, Bayshore. You can include Citygate in this, International Village, Collingwood Village, Arbutus Gardens, Fraser Lands. Wow. There were thousands of units coming onto the market, half of them rental investors. Well, that saved our ass. Mm. We could then do things like basically freeze the West End, stop the change, because at that point, if there was going to be change, it meant the demolition of three-story walk-ups. Same thing was happening in Carisdale. Uh, Burnaby, the mayor, lost the election, I think, because mm-hmm. of what happened in, in Metrotown, south of Metrotown. So we knew politically that that this would be catastrophic. Every building coming down would be an issue. People would mobilize against it. And here was the thing. <laughs> when you looked at what replaced it, which might be a 16-story condo, there was going to be a drop in density. There would be many people living in it as that three-story walk-up mm-hmm. with maybe 10 suites per floor, you know, 30 units, and filled with elderly women, people who had lived there for some time in an affordable rental building. Oh, this is lose, lose, lose. Where then do you find the housing? Right back to this question. I think at this point, we'll see what happens with city plan, but I'd be very skeptical that it would produce a consensus large enough to address that underlying issue. Where can change happen on the scale needed to make a difference? Are you still going to basically give existing neighborhoods a de facto veto or slow down the rate of change so that it doesn't make much difference? Where is your next mega project? Well, Actually, there is a place, places, and I think it may be the most important change that occurs in Vancouver in the next 10 years. Transportation, Jericho. I suspect. Oh, G- of course, the, the Jericho. University Endowment Lands. Yeah, yeah. Heather Lands. Mm-hmm. All of the lands now that are in partnership with MST, Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil Development Corporation, in partnership with Canada Lands or others. The Squamish have indicated, you know, 3,000 units at the south end of Burrard Bridge. Okay, mm-hmm. I think they kind of pulled that number out of the air, but it, it demonstrates the scale at which now these lands are going to likely be developed. There are the new mega projects. There they are. So thousands of units will come from these lands. Now, here's the fascinating thing. Is this reconciliation? Is the presumably billions of dollars of assets now going to flow through to about you know six to 10,000 people in some way, it had better. That's kind of the point. Well, okay, so we have this interesting thing happening now where the biggest developers may well be the First Nations. And, and they are going to have a substantial change on the city, both in terms of the value that, that can be taken from it, it's real estate, and how it's going to be planned and developed. What's our relationship with nations, the First Nations? Is it uh, they get to develop, and basically, you know, certainly in the case of the Squamish, that's, they get to do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to be the route to reconciliation. There's going to have to be an intimate, involved, economic, development, planning relationship that's far more sophisticated than the current relationship that we have where, you know, at every event someone says we're on the unceded territory, maybe some drumming will be involved. It's an archetype, I can see its value, but it's it's romantic. Yeah, This is not the world now that we are very likely to go in when we're addressing both the housing crisis and reconciliation. It's a singular opportunity 
I would think, in the history of the city. So we'd better pull this one off. Everybody's got a stake in it. Could address a significant part of the housing crisis. Could be, yes, what reconciliation really means when you get down to it. And it deals with an historic wrong on the scale. Well, at this point, we get into the, you know, all of the loaded words that go with it. It's easy to see how that it could go wrong if it turns into a culture war political fight, just as much as you can see how great it will be if we can address these issues simultaneously. Yeah, it seems like a, a really good opportunity, but also a bit of a, a daunting task on the horizon. We're good at it. I'm. You see, this is the thing. Well, I We're wonder in the real estate community, you know, this is something that people talk about as uh, the indigenous communities and nations being big players in development Absolutely. now. But it's not a conversation I hear in the general public. It's hard to know how to have the conversation. Yeah. Are we afraid to have it? Oh, yeah. This is minefield stuff. Yeah. Hey, settler, colonialist, genocide. The words are incredibly loaded. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tim Egan has a lovely way of saying it there. Uh, preemptive pejoratives. You know, you throw that any of those words in, and basically, as he says, it closes minds and ends conversations. It ain't productive. Or... It's something that, okay, white privilege, all of these loaded words, right? The idea is that through different lenses, I'm talking now from my ac academic background, whether it's gender or race or all of these things, white men in particular have to understand the, a different world or see a different world. Okay, I understand that. But if it's to close my mind in the sense now you're not giving me any room yeah, or it ends the conversation, mm, I don't think the results are going to work out well. That's what it does. It's a conversation ender. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It can be. Now, uh, again, tough conversations need to be had, and <laughs> it's difficult. Hmm. I absolutely get that. Uh, but I'm not prepared, uh, at least as a guy who grew up in this place on Vancouver Island, and I get to play my gay card. I'm in a marginalized community. <laughs> you know, It turns into almost caricature. It turns into caricature. And again, I think we're certainly with First Nations. We're way beyond that. Well, I don't know if reconciliation is something we're going to be able to solve in our conversation <laughs> here today. To bring it back to to uh, the real estate for a minute, oh, you yeah. know, we, we, we were talking about the, the Jericho and, and these areas. These are very desirable locations. Oh, indeed. So I'm more interested in where's the carrot to move out to some of those outlying areas when you said it yourself, the West End, I got the beach, I got Stanley Park right there. Yeah. Where, where's my carrot as a millennial to to move out to... Neighborhoods that are just as good, if not better. Yeah. So you might think about Laura Lonsdale. I think it's the best of the Vancouverism-style neighborhoods that we built. There's the best example. Uh, now, various choices in, in Burnaby, again, depending on the scale. The model that we are looking to more and more, I think, is is Asia. So rather than even comparing ourselves to some of the European examples of... Uh, of these high-density residential neighborhoods. Um, I would look now more to Singapore and what I've seen in Tokyo, certainly some of the Chinese experimentations, say, along the Shanghai metro lines. They're well advanced in the building of, uh, of high-density neighborhoods that can handle, well, I mean, look at the Chinese. You don't see favela in Chinese cities, you don't see what you would say in a South American city, them building up, just mm -hmm. making do, building out of um, whatever they can find. Uh, now, what the Chinese have produced, again, are these awful sl <laughs> slab buildings. It's the scale, however, that we can learn a lot from. Right. Now, again, these are, these are tough conversations to have because uh, looking to Asia and recognizing that that's, to a great extent, what we are, 52% of the people of the city of Vancouver are people of color. Now, it's largely Asian. And we now have the second generation from the time when, after 1967, our immigration strategies changed, looking less at Europe and more at other places in the world. At the same time, things like Hong Kong were happening. So we know who we are. We can see ourselves. This is who we've become. And looking only at models from the States or Europe kind of misses, I think, yeah. An essential part of the dynamism of the city. You look at Metro Town today along the new basically expanded SkyTrain station at the 50-story towers. That's Asian scale. It's hard to find anything like that in North America and, and pretty rare in Europe. Uh, okay. Are we doing it 
better? How are we doing, given the council that we have now and maybe the one previous? How are we doing navigating this this change, this generational change where, like you said, the, the first generation immigrants from the 60s are, are now maybe in a place where they're ready in some of those neighborhoods for that change that we're talking about to get to these uh, nodes and town centers. So how's the council uh, managing this? They want a conversation. Change? Yeah. They really believe, most of them, I think, that if the conversation and the process is properly conducted, it will produce a consensus. Uh, I think that is naive. <laughs> I think they'll find out very quickly that there won't be a consensus, except that the neighborhoods should basically have a say and effectively a veto over anything that fundamentally changes the scale or character. If they're fine with that, it goes back to where this conversation started, mm -hmm. then recognize that the housing crisis is not solved in Vancouver and that this is uh, you're going to be dependent on the rest of the region taking the growth that, that we won't accommodate. Uh, okay, well, that's fine, but it means that the place becomes ever more globally valuable. That keeping these neighborhoods... Uh, the Kitsilanos and Car well, basically all of them, mm -hmm. still lo lo looking largely like single-family early 20th century neighborhoods, well-maintained, spectacular infrastructure, good schools, excellent transit, turning more and more green, becoming uh, places of model sustainability. Of course they're going to be valued so high that the competition for them, one way or the other, regardless of how much you try to control of it, uh, will be reflected in who lives there. I think no matter what the value is, whether it comes down to tenure, do you have some security of place? If you're a renter, do you have uh, controls, rent controls, rent eviction controls? Does the city provide more and more constraints on what can be done so that, that you have a form of tenure? You have security that you can be there. Plan for that. Live your life. Far better life. It's the same for owners. Are they going to be able not only to expect to retain their value, will be they be able to profit from it in some significant way for their future health care? Whatever it is in their minds, they're going to have that. It all comes back to trying to keep the scale and character of the neighborhoods there, the, themselves. And, but with the exception of the First Nations projects, pretty much everything kind of stays the same. It, the values increase. The people change. But physically, the uh, city looks a lot the same. When I moved into the West End in 1978 and we rezoned it in 89 to discourage change, I can count on a couple of hands how many new buildings there are. I mean, I can name them. Yeah. Uh, we so constrained what it was possible to do to keep basically the stability there. We provide enough housing elsewhere so that it took the pressure off the West End. We didn't induce scarcity. If a landlord tried to raise your rent above a certain point, off to Yale Town and downtown south, you could go. Get one of those brand new condos for rent. Right, maybe a bit more, but you had parking and good plumbing. So all of those dynamics were working well. You won't get that if basically you have a city plan process that results in, yeah, no, we're more or less keeping things the same. And we're just going to put more controls on so that the people who are here will benefit and it will become basically a meter to keep the growth pressure elsewhere. Mm. If the rest of the region does provide, by the way, a relief, it kind of works. Right. It kind of works. And we're, so with what changes we've seen this year uh, on the municipal level and the global forces that are impacting the real estate market as well as uh, provincial and, oh, well. and federal level, <laughs> has it been a has a 2019 been a good year for us in in the region in terms of real estate and and what's happening? Yeah, because all the seismic forces that are underway globally haven't really hit us, mm. right? No, we've been so far protected, but you can feel those seismic plates beginning to move. We're talking just after China has effectively devalued the, the one. Uh, there's a trade war going on, the consequences of which it's not clear. Huge global movements of capital, of course, have been underway now for decades. Uh, but the only thing I can predict is that no way is things going to remain stable enough so that we will live in our gorgeous little bubble that we have here without being affected. What that will be, just look <laughs> at the last two years. The market, by and large, will take care of that, what, 60 70% that we're still going to rely on them for. Mm. People who basically say the developers really shouldn't have a say in directing the city, that's absurd on the face of it. They're the ones who are shaping, literally building the city. They have to be involved, and the relationship should be very close. 
uh, they're regulated. We zone. We're, it's, I mean, I did that. To go back to what the current <clears throat> council is going to be struggling with, well, if they want to keep the neighborhoods, the bargain, more or less intact, they have to find these other places. First Nations may provide it for them. But there will be other opportunities, I think. And I would go back, this is my radical suggestion, of looking at Carisdale, looking mm. at those models, the Amblesides, the places unquestionably successful. High-rise model, again, call them mid-rises by our standards today, do them incredibly well, sustainably. Make sure there's a mix of housing. Make it 50% non-market if you can. Do all kinds of things to lever it, to make sure that the landowners and those who already are there will benefit in a tangible way. Might mm. have to be, you know, directly. Uh, all right. And then if that works, now you've got a, something you can grow up with. So we are finding our way back to both the streetcar neighborhoods that we shaped the city in, fundamental fabric, makes so much sense, transit-oriented, walkable, Yeah. mixed with the West End, sufficient density to accommodate people in an affordable, sustainable, and effective way. Coming back to the working with the First Nations and, and what happened with all the mega projects in the 90s, this is our now our developer that we need to work closely with is well, these different nations and yeah, we no, are I think it's but, already happening. And it is happening. Um not covered much in any kind of media, but what's the forum? Is it council meeting with the different councils from well, the, the Canada nations, Lands or? MSD yeah. that's underway. They've already got a public process starting. Yeah. Uh I think work work was done on that for Heatherlands. Certainly, uh, Jericho is going to proceed in such an interesting way that there'll be so much more involvement, particularly when we get a sense of the scale of it. The Squamish one, I think still, in my mind, uh, it, <laughs> they've thrown out something provocative. But remember, yeah. it, it accompanies already what Concord Pacific owns on the brewery. The whole south end of the bridge is going to be a really quite dramatic change. No question about that in some form. And it won't be just First Nations. So here, it's relationship with Kitts Point. It's where Colleen Hardwick lives. It's a neighborhood that has... Uh, uh, more than any other, really reflects uh, the desire to keep scale and character. Yeah, call it nimbyism if you wish, but understandably, that's a beautifully a gem be like trade off. Yeah. So on the other side of Anya Point, do they understand, and and are they going to respond in such a way as to say no? I I can't see that. Hmm. Uh, that would be a selfishness on a scale that makes them truly vulnerable. You've managed to protect your neighborhood, but if you, now you're going to say, rather like, say, the West End downtown south, we want to keep the West End as it is, but we don't want you to build downtown south. We don't want you to provide a lot of other more housing. Uh, no. No, mm. that dynamic has created the, some, the housing crisis. Right. So how long do you see this? Uh, with all your years on council, and I'm granted it's a little different now, how long do we see some... So we can get a picture of, of maybe how this is all going to look, at well, least with the Burrard. Plan, that's uh, three years. So the city plan's three years out, yeah. but in terms of the, because the Something First Nations the stuff don't count really in the city plan. Oh, yeah, no, gonna, I think they all definitely have to. They're going to count be for that in the there. conversation. Yeah, Absolutely, I, must. So it's very yeah. comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, I, uh, I I was on a debate the Urbanarium had on whether we should have a city plan, and I argued no. Uh, and the way that it scored, we won that debate. I've said, look, the amount of political capital and time it's going to take to affirm, essentially, that we're keeping the scale and change of our community, while at the same time you put off the questions of where and how growth will really be handled, I don't think that's going to work out. Or if it does, uh, you're still going to move the focus away from this overall planning vision to the projects that you're still going to have to deal with, the rezonings that aren't going to go away. If you always say, basically, we have to wait to city plan, you're essentially shutting the city down, and that is not a viable political strategy. Mm -hmm. So that isn't going to happen either. Is it worth then doing? Well, at a high level, and we've done that before. But we've done it basically, whether it's sustainability or transportation, we focused on something that you can kind of get your teeth into. You can deal with because it has boundaries, you know, Transport 2050 or something. Uh, uh, sustainability plans, greenest city, part of that. That, to me, that's a very productive way to go. Mm -hmm. And then for neighborhoods that are really under pressure or are going to go through change or want change, deal with them at that neighborhood or district level. Do those local area plans. You don't have to have a big city plan so long as you have infrastructure planned, so long as you know basically what you're doing in the way of growth, what you have to accommodate, so long as you have basically a transportation system that is providing access, so long as you've got that sustainability strategy and put a bunch of other lenses on it. But you want to have everything in a city plan 
until you get down to the ground, if you draw the lines on the map and those colors that go with it, as complex as you want to make them, you don't really have anything for people to talk about. Mm. I don't know if that's an ominous note to end it on. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> it does mean we're going to go back to doing what we do well, Yeah, which is thinking about how change occurs on the scale of, call it the West End or the mega project. Uh, yeah, because we are good at that. <laughs> and you guys, you guys have uh, definitely benefited figured out how to sell lifestyle and value, not just floor space. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that and it happened very early on with the mega projects. The way that uh, the real estate and development community began to sell their projects, their condominiums, eh, they weren't selling you a quote condo, yeah, pretty the same pictures, but no, they were selling you the values of the city. And since they were helping to pay for it with all those uh, community amenity charges, that yeah. seems to be fair enough. And you got great views to produce marketing materials. Always with, the right? views. Always <laughs> the views. So, you know, we could do something like the view corridors. Yeah. A public policy that was pretty extreme by most city standards, but there was understanding in the city of why that was valuable. Are we going to hold on to those view corridors? They, the longer they are, I was about to say, are we going to lose Stanley Park? Do you think yeah. maybe some of it will go to development? How likely do you think that is? Mm. Uh, zero. The view corridors, though, I think uh, because they are dynamic in the sense that, you know, you're view changes, as it were, uh, you can look at doing things with them as almost sculptural objects in the city, but it has to be done with respect, always an understanding that you're not just trying to nibble away. Same with the ALR. How can you continue to achieve the benefit those view corridors were meant for, the saving the agricultural was, agriculture was meant for? It isn't just the act of saving them, it's what you save them for. And that's that, when we do it well, is why, why we love Vancouver, and why every generation has an obligation to pass it along at least as good as they found it, but really better. And I'm thinking back in my lifetime and been so blessed to have watched that actually happen. I think you've done a fantastic job doing your part on that for your generation, and you continue to do that with your with your blog, pricetags.ca, and the podcast. And we just got to say thank you for all the well, It's <clears> been, all been the a privilege work. to be able to have done this in my life. But thank you, Josh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. I appreciate it. Well, I think we'll leave it off there. And uh, that's the first episode of Vancouver Real Estate Today. Join us next time for the rest of my conversation with Gordon Price, where we find out what the future holds for Vancouver real estate.